All right, today we're gonna to talk about collecting data. What does it entail? Where does it fit in the whole process of things? Because basically, when designing your study, Data collection is the most important. Why do you think it's so important? Yeah, that's that's you get. Or if you get the wrong type of data, it could nullify your entire study. All the work you just done is just gone for nothing. In other words, if you're doing a quantitative study where you need to collect numbers and all you do is observe, that's not going to give you what you need. So if you're going to, all depends on what you're studying. That's when, when you're planning your study, you have to see exactly what do you want to do, how do you want to do it, without interfering the people that you're studying. Because quant qualitative studies are observational. You don't want to be part of it. You want to sit back and not affect their daily behaviors at all. Because the moment you interfere with anything that goes on, you've changed the outcomes. For example, it's just say you're a, a biologist and you want to study a new tribe of people that they found in South and Central America. By going there and being seen by these people, you've affected, change, you've effectively changed their daily habits. How would you feel if there was a camera in your house, in your living room? Somebody study. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't like it. But what if you didn't see that camera? What if it was a hidden camera? And it was a study, of course. You, you knew it was a study. Would you feel different if you could see the camera or if you couldn't see the camera? If you couldn't see the camera, you wouldn't think twice about it. So, but, so in other words, that interference has just altered the way this, the out, outcomes of your study. So it's, it's null and void. But we're talking about also in experiments, what differentiates experiment from a, a study and observation? An experiment is you have to include a change. An experiment, you have to include a change. Something has to be changed to see if it's better or worse than what's going on. So the wrong data gives you wrong results, nullifies your study. We have something called the gold standard. The gold standard is the randomization of of the interjection of a placebo or what we call a treatment group
into your study. What is a placebo? What's that? It's actually a, well, it's just, yeah, it's, it's something that's fake, but in our case, we're doing, it's a sugar tablet. During the whole COVID thing, they were, they were giving vaccinations to people during the testing trials. They were giving test vaccines to people. Some of them just got just water, sugar water, which you always that your body has already. Some of them got the medicine. And then what you do there is you have the placebo group, which is which is the treatment group. That's the people who get the real the medicine, uh, the the test. Then you have a control group. control group it's nothing and the placebo group gets either the real medicine or the fake medicine the reason you do this is because you have to have the control group to see what would happen if nothing was done that's the control group the placebo, placebo group is, let's say this half, half of the room is the control group, this half is the placebo group. Now I would randomly select some of y'all to get the actual medicine. The other half of y'all would get nothing. Well, you, you would get a fake medicine. Why would they do that? Yeah, to see two things, to see if it actually works and to see if, if people feel, um, um, hypochondriacs if they think they have these symptoms but they don't really have the contracts so what they do in the placebo group is they'll give you the medicine and they'll, they'll watch to see what goes on the placebo effect is when someone in the placebo group that is not getting the actual treatment. They're getting the fake stuff. Report to have changes due to the treatment. So you see, I mean, you see how complex a study can be if you deal with people, it's even work with kids. So the placebo effect is this. I'm getting sugar tablets, but it's just, it's just it's for back pain. All of us have back problems. I get the sugar tablets. I'm saying, wow, it worked. I'm feeling much better. So that has to be taken into consideration. Why? It's mental. Was this person's back really hurting to begin with? Or do they want the attention? So the, the placebo effect, the placebo studies, specific groups, all this stuff, you see the chances of your data being skewed. So that's why I call this a gold standard. It helps alleviate bad data from good data. Because the, the more deeper we can go into the studies to see exactly is this really working or not the better it is that's the gold standard
Here's an example. The Salk vaccine experiment. In 1954, an experiment was designed to test the effectiveness of the Salk vaccine to prevent polio, which has killed or paralyzed thousands of children. By random selection, 401,000 children were randomly assigned to two groups. In group one, 200,000 students were given a treatment consider consisting of the salt vaccine injection. 201,000 children were injected with a placebo containing no drug at all. The children were assigned the treatment or placebo group through a process of random selection. That's going to be important for us because the more randomized you can make a study, the more accurate it could become. The, the, the less interference you have on who gets in which group, the more accurate the data is going to be. So through a process of random selection, equivalent to flipping a coin, among the ch children given the sock vaccine, 33 later developed paralytic polio. And among the children given a placebo, 115 later developed paralytic polio. So what does that show you? That the vaccine actually worked. From 200,000, we only got 33. As opposed to 201,000, we only got 15, 115. So that was a good enough, that's, that's five times as effective than not having it. You know, remember, this is also 1954, so they didn't have all the technology they have now. Polio is pretty much eradicated in the world. Actually, but it's coming back. So random selection, randomization is as very important as, as you can get it. It's very, it's very important. Let's just look at some def definitions here. An experiment. is when a study's subjects the word subjects used when people are studying. So whenever you use people, you use the word subjects. When, su when a study subjects or experimental oops, units, if it's anything else. are given a treatment. That's an experiment. One of the first most famous studies in biology is the studying the Pavlovian response. Anybody ever hear that Pavlovian response? What does it mean? Yes, exactly. The dog and bell and salivate. Yes. <laughs> dog, bell, ba. <laughs> well, actually, they first used mice. Uh, they used to use mice is that when the light came on, they'd go and to this one corner and get cheese. They thought, hey, if that works, let's try something else. Let's see about if it works for bigger mammals. So they used bells with dogs, and it worked. Anytime the bell rang, the dog would start salivating, drooling, because they know they're going to they get a treat. That's the Pavlovian response. You guys are subject to that also. Watch this. And, and whenever you're in a crowd of people, 
anytime a phone rings, a cell phone rings, watch almost everybody in that room. What do they do? They check to see, no, they, they, they check to see if it's their phone. It's, you know, you're expecting me to look over, because that's a distraction. But anytime there's a call, check how many people see it, check their phones. And then they play it off, so I'll just check and see if I got a message or not. It's a, no, and it's, it's, it's very weird. It's anytime it happens. And in classes, as soon as the teacher says, okay, class is over, watch the students. It's going to be that. It's going to check the phone. See if, see if I missed any messages during the last five seconds. I didn't check in. So that's, that's called a Pavlovian response. It's, it's, it's so interesting when you watch, observe people. That's why I love at, at airports and stuff. I try when I travel. I love observing people's behaviors. Yeah, it's conditional behavior. Yeah, that's that's what they call it later on. Is conditioned behavior. Okay, and observational study. That's an experiment. The other study we have is called an observational. Study. is when observations and measures of specific characteristics are taken and this is important. And there is no modification. Or interference. Of the subjects or units. That's an observational study. It's when observations and measures, measurements of specific characteristics are taken. Okay, that's everybody that's an observation. But the most important part is there's no modification or interference. If you're going to observe something, you're going to observe it without. Put your phone up. You could live five minutes without looking at self messages that mean nothing. Because the minute you interfere or interject a modification, you've changed. The, the natural course of events. So your, your observations are, are worthless. Here's an example. Ice cream and drownings. Is, they're, they're trying to put this to causation. The observe, observational study. Past data to conclude that ice cream causes drownings based on showing that increases in ice cream sales were associated with increased drownings. <laughs> okay. When it gets hot, what, what do people do outside? They eat ice cream. When it's hot, people outside like to go swimming. So they're saying because they're eating more ice cream, there's more drownings. Is that, is that a logical statement? No. I mean, this is that people want to go swimming no matter what, whether they eat ice cream or not. So the mistake is what's called a lurking variable. A lurking variable is this. It's something that's not obviously known that's in the study, a variable that's in the study that affects your outcome, that could affect your outcome, is a lurking variable of temperature. In this case, it's temperature. And the failure to see that as temperature increases, Ice cream sales increase and drowning increase as more people swim. 
So the lurking variable here is something they didn't think about, temperature. All they saw was the number of ice cream sales go up and number of drownings go up. So how would you work that? I know the rest of the thing brought up. Like, if this is the metrics, how would you put that one? Lurking? Lurking the whole, the whole setup, is it a statistical metric or practice metric? Well, in this case, you're looking at for causational or correlational. Correlation. Yeah. Correlation. But is there a correlation between increase of ice cream and increase in drowning? Yeah. It's the same as the manatee. Remember? The more boats means oh, more deaths of manatees. This is this is people now instead. So more <laughs> it takes boats to kill manatees, it takes ice cream to kill humans. So that's an observational study. But you always have to look at, are there any other extenuating variables in your study that, that is making these things occur? Temperature and time are usually the first two things you look at. Students guess on tests, on multiple choice tests, more during the last five minutes of a test than during the first 10 minutes of the test. Well, yeah, why? Because you're running out of time. So it's not really a, a, a secret. It's just because they want to finish and it's better guessing than getting nothing. You at least have a good 25% chance of getting one right. An experiment. One group will be the control group and not get ice cream, while another group will be the experiment, the test group, or the control group, or the, uh, the treatment group, and will get ice cream. Observe what happens and record the number of drownings of both groups. Well, are you going to see a difference? No, if you're going to drown, you're going to drown. This whole thing about when they say, wait 30 minutes before you go swim after you eat. How wrong is that? That's so very wrong. You could swim no matter what. It's the same as running. It's the same as walking. What if you were a lifeguard and just got off lunch? Uh, I'm sorry, keep on flopping. I'll be there in 20 minutes. No, it's, it's eating has nothing to do with drowning. So which method do you think is better, observational or experimental? And why? Why? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, which one of these two methods, the observational study or experimental study, which one of the two methods of research is better? Experimental, because why? Well, that could be the worst thing, no. Yeah. Right, you're, you're actually testing to see if something's true. Is the ice cream the cause of these drownings? You're observing, you're only making guesses. If you're actually doing something, you're right. You're, you're, you're actually testing it to see if it's, if it's anything going wrong with it. So yeah, so in that case, the experimental group is much better. When would an observational study be better? When would an observational study be better? Not really, but you're not really observing the process. Okay, go go with that. That, that is that is an observational study. Okay, what are you studying? Um, this and it's, now you're going to who and they, 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 what kind of people they are. So you could, those are the lurking variables there. But traffic is, is a good one. In cities that are beginning to grow, what you'll see a lot of times at intersections, you'll see these very thick black uh, wires going across the road. 
those are for two purposes. One, to count the number of cars that go through this and during what time of day and the speed in which they travel. If there's a large number of traffic going both directions, yes, then you need to have a light to, for safety purposes. You're not affecting anybody. You're just observing the numbers of the cars going by. Also, I, this is what I like to do, is I love to observe people on highways. I call, you, know, you have four-lane highway. I-20 is one of the biggest in the nation. You see people, when they get on the highway, no matter if you go from Dallas to Fort Worth or, or from the DeSoto to Fort Worth, they're going to stay on the far right-hand lane and sit there. I call those the bottom dwellers because they sit on the very bottom and then because they think I'm going to get off the highway eventually. Then you have people who sit in the far left lane and just sit there at speed limit. But because their thought is you can't go faster than 70 miles an hour. So you can't, I don't have to get up. Uh, invariably, yes, if anybody gets an accident because you've been there, you are now a co-contributor to an accident because you are not the law. You can't dictate this. So if somebody wants to get out of your way, it's common sense. Also, if you're going to travel straight distance for a long way, sit in the third lane. If you're going to pass, go in the left lane. If you're going to about to exit, go in the second lane. If Americans follow that with those rules, like Europe does, we wouldn't have traffic. We wouldn't have accidents. Even at that, I mean, Europe has so few. They have people who travel much faster than here. Well, that, that's that's another study. No, actually, or or the opposite. The people who, if you look at people's tires, they're almost bald and they go 80 miles an hour on, on wet roads. And if what everybody should do every now and then is when, on an empty road, when if it's raining, slam on your brakes. Go about 30, 40 miles, 40, 50 miles, slam on your brakes. See how far you slide. See how safe your car really is. But then you go 80, 90 miles an hour on the highway and they go 20 feet behind the car next in front of them. That's the company right. Every time it rains, um, Monday morning, it had a rain early in the morning. I turned on the news just to test my hypothesis. And sure enough, all over the Metroplex, accidents here, accidents here because of people, one, driving like idiots, and two, uh, driving like idiots. <laughs> so you have to take things. In Europe, you can't get a law, you can't get a license unless you go through a course. And it costs about $2,000 to get a license. Uh, is, was, but that's the reason they have fewer, much fewer accidents, many, many fewer less accidents than we do in America. And they have no, on the highways, they have no limits on the, how fast you can go. You have Ferraris and Lamborghinis and BMWs and Mercedes that go over 100 miles an hour. I used to drive over 100 miles an hour all the time. But... Yeah, way up. And then you have to be, if somebody's coming behind you, you have to, by law, you have to get out of the way. They have priority because they want to go fast. They want to go past you. America? No. If you pa try to pass somebody, they can shoot you. Yeah, it, we are in America. We're going back to the old West days where, I mean, the law is whoever's got the gun. Case in point, road rage. You don't have that in Europe because it's a law and people follow laws. In America, no. The law is whatever I want to interpret the law to be. And there you have it. There's, there's the problem there. It's, 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 I don't, it's not, I'm not breaking the law unless I get caught. And then you have all these people who are now attorneys saying, well, that's not what the law says. Yet you didn't graduate high school with a 4.0. You still tell me what the law says. So, yeah, it's very, it's very, it's very scary in America driving. That's why I can't, I can't wait to retire and go to the country and just live out my the rest of my life on a hundred acre farm. Where I don't have to worry about people. I'll grow my own food, get, have a cow for milk. Yeah, it's, the faster I can get away from the city, the better. All right, uh, designing. 
and experiment. Besides the steps, well, let's go ahead and off the cuff right now. Let's, let's go ahead and what are the steps in designing an experiment? Form a hypothesis. You have to have a reason for your study. Because the, the whole study itself is to answer a question. If you, if you think about it, it all boils down to you study in school. Why? To pass the test, to graduate. Well, when you pass the test, what do you do? You have to answer the questions. Same thing in, the, in an experiment, in, in a study. Your hypothesis, let's say, is why do leaves turn brown in the fall and green in the summer? That's a, a valid hypothesis. I mean, that's a valid question. It all starts with a research question. The more defined you can make your research question, the more accurate your study is going to be. Why do leaves change colors? So then what's the next step after that? Hmm? A source of what? Yeah, because in your question, you're going to figure out, well, okay, what am I really looking for? Yeah, before you get to that point there, because you can't just collect data because you haven't done what yet. We have to know the background. In other words, what is the biology of a leaf? What is its purpose? What does it do? Why would it change colors? Once you understand the background, then you determine the type of study. What you discuss, we'll get to the types. Um, determine the type of study you're doing, because once you get determine what kind of type of this type of study you're doing, you can determine. Type of data to collect? Is it observational data? Is it quantitative data? Is it stratified data? Is it what? Then you can design your study. Implement it. Collect the data. Ask.
After collecting data, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Analyze the data. And that, at that point, you determine one of two things. Do I need more data? Or am I done? Because what you're doing here is the question answered. If it is, move on. Publish your conclusion or go back and start from the beginning. Or go back to step four and repeat. Step four is determine the type of data you need. Because obviously if you can't answer the question, you either don't have enough data or you got the wrong data. For example, if you're you're walking in the forest in, in winter time, in the fall time, and you're seeing the leaves are changing colors, you notice the different types of trees. So you think, okay, maybe it's the how tall the trees are, or how wide, how round the tree trunks are, or how many leaves are, how many trees. All these are possible variables. But as you go through one by one by one, you eventually realize that each tree behaves much the same way and around October that's when they start changing what happens at that point that's when the weather start changing and so that's why I mean it nowadays it seems very trivial the leaves change colors because of the weather changing temperature changing but back then when people first started asking these questions it didn't happen okay let's look at now the three types of Experiments. Experimental design includes Replication. What is replication? Okay. In other words, you can repeat this, you can repeat the study. Repetition of an experiment. on more than one subject provides better results. If you think about it, if I surveyed each one of you all, in essence, what I'm doing is I'm repeating the same experiment on each one separately. So each experiment, if I have a group of people, it really boils down to each person is doing their own experiment. 
So the more people you have, the better your results are going to be. Think of the polio one. Each person that either got a placebo or the medicine, they're their own experiment. And I put them all together for a bigger result. So that says, if you, if you do it on more than one subject, in this case, it's people or unit, the more you have, the better you, your results. So that's the repetition. Okay, also, repetition also works in repeating the actual study itself. When you publish something online or in, re in the real world, it's called peer-reviewed to be credible. It has to be peer-reviewed, meaning that either somebody took your information and your data and repeated the experiment to see if it's true, or they looked at it and they did the numbers mathematically and see if it works. It's a necessity. You cannot claim something unless it's been proven numerous times by other people. Uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, the mathematics of it. He, when he published it, well, back then they didn't have peer reviews. What people did around the world instantly is they took his information and tried to repeat his mathematics to see if he got the same answers. Since everybody got the same, then it became a law as opposed to a theorem, as opposed to a postulate or a hypothesis. So what you want to do is, if you want to do some studies, look any research that's been done and repeat it and publish that finding. Why would, why would that be valid? What would that prove? If you took the same, if I took the same study somebody else did and, and repeated it, I went, to, I went to the library, found a study done in 1990 and repeated it today and it got the same answers. What would that prove? It's valid for more than one instance. Because to be honest with you, if I was doing my research in, in education technology, if I get the same results as somebody did in 1990, that means they their study is very, very valid because it works no matter what time and how far technology progressed. Because think about how, where was technology back in 1990? If non existent, people barely had, nobody had cell phones really then. They were just coming out. But computers, you couldn't go to the store and buy one, or you, laptops weren't invented yet. You had to pretty much build it from scratch. You had to install the operating system, in, upload and uh, uh, install all the programs. So, all this stuff, technology wasn't around back then. So, if my study, on technology worked today as it worked back then, that means that was a very good study. That was good research. But if I get different answers, then I got a new study. Why did I get different answers? There is your research question. Why? If you can answer the why of something, then you've, you've answered it. You've you've researched it, and then you have the answer. Okay, number two. Blinding. When the subjects... Don't know if they are in the control group or the treatment group.
piece of point, the, the, the medication ones, whether you're in the, you have to, you have the placebo group, you have the treatment group, and you have a control group, so a separate group. That way you don't know if you're really getting the medicine or not. And then whether it's psychosomatic, if it's, if it's in your brain or not. And this is a very important, is the randomization. When the subjects are assigned to different groups by random selection. So they have, they have an equal chance of being in either group. Now, the random selection, that's the toughest part. How do you randomly select people to do things or put them in groups? How would you select? So if we had a group here, it is in our room here. How would you randomly select people for a, let's see, what's something, a technology study? Okay, we're, we're, we've just invented a new app that'll answer all your questions. That'll do everything for you, period, everything. How would you select people to give give that app to? Half the group half doesn't get it, half the group does. Okay, that's one possible way. What's the downside of that? Well, everybody can pick the same number or the same type, odd or even. A lot of people hate odd numbers. They'll always do things in the even. It's, I mean, if they knock on doors, they, it's, how many times do you knock on a door before you stop knocking? It, yeah, so, so you do everything free. So a lot of people do, do, do knock, knock, knock. Or if, or there's some, they're going to do it twice, knock, knock. <laughs> and how many times did it ring before you hang up? I'm never paying attention. That's true because it always goes. So, but yeah, it's determining on how to randomly select people for. Remember, when we use the word subjects, that it refers to humans. Uh, I'm, I'm saying this is generic to mean everything, whether it's animals or anything. So, and that's going to be a, a big part of the course, the class today is how will we randomly select things to do? Well, let's define random. Let's define it. Well, let's go even further. Let's go to simple random selection. We're not going to do anything complex yet. This is called a Random sample. A a carefully designed experiment. where N subjects are selected in a way that ensures a 
every possible sample of the same size n has the same chance. of being chosen. Terrifying Terif 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 design experiment where, well, I'll get to you what N means. N subjects are selected in a way that ensures that every possible group, every possible group of the same size n has the same ch chance of being chosen. What does n represent? The sample size, yeah. Of how many how many units or sample or subjects are you going to use? So I'm I'm choosing my my subjects in a way that everybody has the same chance of being done. You're right. And somebody said earlier, well, if again, if you had to choose, how would you choose? Pick numbers from one to ten. That's one way. What's another way? A raffle. That's actually there was an interesting book written a long time ago called The Raffle. It's where, because of population control, once a month, everybody in the town would come out. It was called lottery. Once a month, everybody come out, and then one one name was chosen to be the sacrifice. Kind of, and then that was taken, of course, by the Hunger Games, where one person from each of the different groups was chosen at random to be sent to the game. Yeah, so so it's not always good to be chosen. Let's put, let's put it that way. If you're in the Hunger Games, so we have the random samples. What's another way? Oh, I'll just give you these. We'll go up here from the bottom up. There is the first one. Randomly selected. They used to use phone books to choose people for jury duty. They would just take the phone book, take, rip, rip out the pages, because you don't want, if you leave them in the book, then you know it's organized already. So you tear out the pages and toss them and then pull out a page, take a pen and poke it somewhere. Wherever it stopped, that person is chosen for the jury. But then the phone books got too large and then they got other ways of doing it, lottery ways. Another way is called a systematic method. What do you think systematic means? How do they do things on assembly lines to see if something's good or bad? It's called quality control. How do they do it there? Every K kth element is chosen. So what they do is Every um, corporation that, that, that makes things, they have quality control. Is, is they'll take every, let's say, hundredth item or 5,000th item and check it. If you ever go to Brenham, what's it, Brenham? Can anybody guess what's it, what Brenham, Texas has that's important to us? Bluebell ice cream. That's where it's made. If if you ever want a great day trip, go there. Was, you go to where they make ice cream. And what they do is every type of ice cream they make, every certain number of them, they, they stop, they take it, they cut it open, they see if it's pure ice cream throughout the whole thing. The case, it's, yeah, it's like the 10th or the 12th or the 100th. 
And this, this is quality control. It's a number, yeah. But it's the same number. Like the, if the, it's the third, in this case, I say third. So it's the third, sixth, ninth, twelfth, fifteenth. So every three, they'll pick one. And they'll, they'll literally take it, they'll cut it open, whether it's the small pint ones or the gallon jugs, they'll take it, they'll, they'll see if it looks uniform. They'll take the ice cream, eat it, see how it tastes. And then they throw it away because that was been tested. Yes, and I've always had thoughts of going to their dumpster and having my own cosmopolitan. <laughs> okay, the next one, convenience. Get your data the easy way possible, the easiest way possible. Here, for those of you in the cheap seats, you can see it now. And again, they did this with a picture of a survey because that's the easiest way to get data. Go to the mall or go to a big store and ask people. Can you think of a, of a big chain store, a big store that does this convenience sampling? Where? No, not Costco. You're close. Costco and Sam's. I love going to those places simply because they have those free samples. If you're hungry, just walk around and after about 20 minutes, you won't be hungry anymore. Because mm -hmm. they have, which is a great deal for the companies. They, they open up the, a box of items and they, they make them and have you test them. Why is that good? Because even if you weren't thinking about it, you are now because you, you've smelt it, you've tasted it. And it increase is proven to increase sales of that specific item. Because why? You know what it tastes like. You know, if I put it in a microwave at home, it's going to taste like this. I don't know about this other stuff. So that's convenient sampling. The next one, stratified. Stratification simply means layers. When you subdivide population into strata, which are groups, layers, with the same characteristic, and then randomly select a sample from there. So example of stratified sampling. Like in, in this room, we have two sides of the room, groups on both sides. That's the first randomization. I stratified the, the glass in half. Now, inside each group, I would go and pick one or two people randomly. That's what stratified sampling is all about. Let me see an example of this where it's used. Well, no, no, I'm just saying, well, here's, here's what it says. It says subdivide. The, what it says on the board, subdivide with your existing group, subdivide it in half. And then cut that. If you have a large group, cut that in half. Cut that in half, cut in half until you have a bunch of subgroups of the size that you want. And then you just pick that. Example of stratified sampling would be in a, a basketball game, the audience in the basketball game. You ever see when they have those t-shirts being thrown out to the, to the audience or hockey games, same thing, is you have the field cut in half. You're either going to be on this side or this side. Okay, so the cannon points this way. So these people don't have a chance at it. Now you have either this half or this half. Cannon points this way. So these people don't get a chance. 
So eventually what happens is they separate and they shoot it someplace and that, that group, that stratified group gets, somebody in there gets that. So again, you sample it. So now, well, this thing says has similar characteristics in the example of the sports metaphor, a sports example, what are their characteristics? What are the similar characteristics of those people? Hmm? The people in the, in the, the t-shirt one, lo location. They bought the tickets in that part of the auditorium. Doesn't have to be male, female. Doesn't have to be tall, short, fat, skinny. It could be anything. So this is what, what, what you would do with this example is, is you, you stratified with men and, female, men and women. And then from there, you further stratify it with a sub number of those. And then we have the third method. The cluster, the cluster sampling. What does partition mean? Yeah, I will use block off. Because when you partition your hard drive in your computer, you're making it into smaller groups, the smaller areas. Subdivide the population in clusters or groups. Then randomly select some clusters, then select all the members within that cluster. Is it random? Well, yeah, because you don't know who's inside these. In this example, it's neighborhoods, blocks, city blocks. You don't know who's in this block, who's in this, this block. You simply think, okay, I, I have my grid already made. I'm gonna pick these three clusters. And that's it. So everybody on this block, everybody on this block, everybody on this block is chosen. And then from there, you have to go door to door and ask people their questions or whatever you're surveying. And here's the example of this one. Here we got it. Right. Yeah, I'm going to send you these anyway, so you, you have to draw them all. Multi stage experiment. What are the, first off, what, is a, what do you think a multi stage experiment is? You mean, what do you mean by different levels? The first level could be like no, no, that, that's because we're doing the, the multi stage experiment. So each stage has to have an experiment in it. So here's what you use in, in multi stages, uh, multi, multi sampling, each stage uses one or the same sampling technique that we just talked about. You can use either cluster or the other ones. Um, and then once you finish that, then the next stage, you do it again. And in the next stage, you do either the same or a different sampling technique. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture. It could, be, it could be all the same. It could be a mixture. Of them, and there's no, no limit to the number of levels you can have or how many stages. In this example, the US government's unemployment statistics are based on surveys of households. It is impractical to personally survey each household in a simple random sample because they would be set so scattered across the entire nation. Instead, the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics collaborate to conduct a survey called the Current Population Survey. The Current Population Survey. A recent survey incorporated multi-stage sampling design, roughly followed as such. One, the entire United States is partitioned into 2,000 
and seven different regions called primary sampling units. You didn't know that, did you? The primary sampling units are metropolitan areas, large counties, com combinations of smaller counties. So the tw 2007 primary sampling units are then grouped into 824 different strata. Wow, I mean, who ever thought about this? Each of the 824 different strata, in each of them, one of the primary sampling units is selected so that the probability of selection is proportional to the size of the population of each primary sampling unit. What does that mean? In each of the 824 different strata, one of the primary sampling units is selected so that the probability of selection is proportional to the size of the population in each primary sampling unit. What, okay, first off, what's the primary sampling unit? Well, it's up here. Yeah, those are the 2007 different regions. And in, in those regions, so we have 2007 different regions of the United States. Here's one region, here's another region, another region. So we have 2007 of those large cities or a combination of a bunch of small cities. They're not the same size. One could be super huge because think of the central Texas or out in West Texas, where you have towns that are hundred miles apart and each town maybe has 30,000 people. So your primary sampling unit is all these areas that contain probably the same amount of people. Now, each one of those are grouped into, into individual stratas. So each one of these, inside each one of these, there are stratas. Now, inside each of these strata, one primary uh, sample unit is chosen. So what they're saying there is within now this subcategory, subcategory, they're all about the same size, number of populations. So that's where we are right there. In each of the 824 selected primary sample units, census data are used to identify the census enumeration district with each containing about 300 households. Enumeration districts are then randomly selected. So you see what happened? We're going from big, big, big to small, 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 smaller. So in each of these enumeration districts, you have about 300 households. In each of the selected enumeration districts, clusters of about four addresses are randomly selected. Not, not particular house addresses, but like on Main Street or this, this street. A responsible person in each of the 60,000 selected households is interviewed about the employment of each status of the household. So what, is it, what have they just done here? Narrowed it down to 60,000 individual households. It was in, in the hopes that the people answering these are gonna be a good representation of the entire nation. We're also talking about time and money because these are all done by in person, going face to face, in person to person. So, yeah, it is pretty narrow, yes. But it, it's, yeah, you're looking at, and then because it's pretty small, you're looking at the accuracy. Will somebody really tell you if they're unemployed? No. Simply by, because of private unions. But people will not have any qualms of telling you they're unemployed if the state gives them unemployment benefits. Sure, I'm unemployed. Are you looking for a job? Yeah, I'm looking. I've, I've applied for three CEO positions. I've applied. <laughs> and this is legitimate. This is what people do. Because if you're unemployed and you've tried 
honestly to try to get a work, the state will give you some money for some certain amount of time based on a lot of criteria. People, some people see this as an easy way of making money. So they won't get a job. And that's come this the state put a, a finite number of payments you can get. But before you get your next payment, first two are, are pretty much free. But after that, you have to show me proof that you're looking for gainful employment. And if you lie in any of these, you're automatically terminated. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty random, but they're hoping that people are going to be honest and see what what they're look, what they're getting is straight up fact. The multi stages of simple design includes combinations of the random, stratified, and cluster samplings at different stages. <clears throat> in this example, the end result is a very yes, it's a very complicated sampling design, but it's much more practical more practical, less expensive, and faster than the simple random design. Everything has to be done for a reason. You have to get this information for a reason. How you get the data has to be for a reason. It has to be more practical, less expensive, and fast. And it has to tell me what I'm looking for. Observational studies. Where does observ where do they get their data from? You can't put it out, can you? It's, it ha it's that important, isn't it? See, that's one thing I, I, I wish I could do. I wish I could read students' text messages to see exactly how important is it. You're paying $800, $400 for a class, and yet you spend half your time on your cell phone checking messages from people who are less inclined to go to school. And their messages, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? Nothing. Are you having fun? Nothing. Are you in class? Yeah. It's boring. Yeah. So, yeah. So, again, I'm giving you guys the option of doing this stuff and doing all your testing and everything online. I'm not giving you the, the tools of doing cheating and anything you can. You're taking a course, you're paying for it for, to better yourself, to get information, to get knowledge. Yes, all this stuff's going to be online. You could cheat on all the tests if you want. But you'll look like an idiot after you graduate and you can't answer basic questions people ask you. And don't ever tell, if, if you cheat and lie and steal in this course, don't ever tell somebody I was your teacher because I want them to know that you're an idiot because of yourself, not because of me. As long as you're doing the work yourself and not, not looking at all the answers and get it done as long as you're doing the work yourself which is the reason i give you guys as many chances at, at the test as you want so again it the the whole honesty things on, on yours is, is how much pride do you have in yourself i'll get off my soapbox i just can't stand cell phones i, I mind i put away it's my boss sent everyone that texted me and called me I put them on hold till, till I'm done. Um, okay, how are observational studies done? Where does data come from? They get the data through observations. and measurements. Which remember, as opposed to an experiment, observational studies do not 
affect the individual, or the, the subject being studied, the unit being studied? So that can come out of anywhere. You see something observed, you say, well, I want to know. That gives you your, your initial one. But then you have you have to have okay. I want to see if that's true for all all people. An observation study is not just one observation; it's a series of observations. Long over time, you're talking about maybe years. Uh, again, next time you go on a trip, when you're waiting for your flight, people watch, see what they do, see see what they, how how they act, how they behave, where they what they do, and come up with a hypothesis. Why are measurements inside this? So are you when you take measurements, height, weight, anything like that? Are you really affecting the person? No. I haven't given them anything. I haven't inconvenienced them in any way, shape, shape matter, form. I just measure them. So an observation is done, or measurement is done. From there, as part one. You figure out when are the observations slash measurements taken. There are three, obviously there are three periods of time. There's the past, the present, and the future. Can you get information, data from the past? Okay, but how, what research would you do to get? Research is for all of them. But what would you do physically? What would you do to get information from the past? Yeah, interviewing. And what else? Where else can, can, can you get information or data from the past? Past studies is good, but yeah. Records, past studies, yeah, so, I mean, interviews are always, always, always the best because they're first person data of past events. If you want to know what it was like in Vietnam, Who's the best person to ask? A vet, vet who, is, who served in Vietnam. Not somebody who just graduated high school and studied Vietnam. <laughs> you wouldn't get much from them. Okay. How about present? How would you get present information? You can also do interviews. But this is taken with a grain of salt because the moment you take an interview, can you take an interview of a present condition? No, because if I'm gonna ask you a question, it has to be of something that happened, even if it's five minutes ago, it by definition is the past. So you can ask people, what are you feeling now? Because of what just happened. There you have current information. Uh, what else? These are just, these are straight up observations. Yeah, that's, that's about it. What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But surveys, yeah, you can. But usually surveys are of something. What do you, what kind of things do you buy? Or do you like this? But yeah, the surveys are the the person's opinions at that minute. Do people's opinions change? Yes. 
I mean, have you ever changed toothpaste? Yeah. And there, to be honest with you, there's no reason to because all toothpaste, as long as it has fluorine in it, it's toothpaste. That's the only thing. Well, yeah, they didn't have the taste. Yeah. That, that Arm & Hammer baking soda stuff tastes like acid. <laughs> or just gargle with acid. <laughs> that red stuff? Yeah, yeah, when it, when it looks too cinnamony, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it, it burns. It's like eating one of those red hots. <laughs> okay, how about future? How would you do future? How would you take a prediction? Well, yeah, yeah. You're on this diet plan. Will it work or is it working? So, yeah, this, this one is the most difficult one. So now these have names. For past events, we call that a Retro, retrospective study. What does retrospective mean? Yeah, it's past, retro. When we, if we look at something retro, it's always in past. In, in present, this is a cohort study. Okay, cohort studies are also in this one. But with this one, we're talking about a cross section, a cross sectional of the population. A cross section is you have your entire data set, or you have what you're, what you're looking at in the present. I want to do a cross section. I want to do a, a random sampling of people in this room. You guys are a cross section of the students at El Centro in the Summer Two program. So I'm, I'm doing a small sampling right now, here and now, of what you guys think your opinions of this. And the reason I say cohort study is because right now, as a group, you guys are in essence a cohort because you're going through this course together as a group. More and more universities and colleges are going to the cohort program with this cohort program, which means you sign up all at the same time and you progress through the program from now to the future. You go at it together. That's what this one means. You start at the same time, and progress future at the same time. So everybody in that cohort has the same characteristics, same driver, same, they have the same characteristics as, as everybody else does. So, you know, when this cohort, we're talking about a small group that's in a classroom. This cohort, we're talking about a group that moves together as a unit. If, you, if and when you, if you do want to go to graduate school, you'll be assigned to a cohort usually. There's more and more. The reason being for that, one, the hardest thing students have the, the most difficulty with is deciding what class will I take next semester. With a cohort, you don't have to worry about that. You're in this program. Here are the courses you have to take. We're going to offer them in these times. You're going to take them in these times. Your entire class, everything's set up for you. You're, and you're also assigned with these cohort programs or the groups. You're assigned not only a, a lead faculty advisor, but a an, another advisor 
that will help you in case you have any questions. The code program is, I think, the way every school should go. The dropout rate is next to zero on those. Individually, you're all worrying, hey, where would I go to? And if I get stuck, well, who do I go to? I mean, like right now, who would you go to in this class if you if you had a question about what we did today? Exactly, not not each other, but on a cohort, you everybody knows everybody else. After the first semester, you know each other, you know their families and everything like that. So that if anything happens, hey, listen, I won't be in class today. Send me your notes when you're done. And then if you get stuck in the homework, you, you can work together in homeworks. Right now, you work on your homework, you're by yourself. In law school, we call that um, a study group. Study groups, if you're going to go through school alone, form a study group in every class you're in. What that means is once a week, you get together and you go over homework assignments, you get ready for tests, you share information. And then that way, when you go home, you have other stuff. And then also, if you have any questions during the meantime, you can get that. So again, the reason I'm saying that is because that's what helped me through in law school. It's a program where in law school, you don't take tests like you do here and you get a grade and that's it. In law school, it's a, your grade is determined on the bell curve. A, B, C, D, F. Depending on where your grade falls, that's your grade. You can have a 92. If, if the lowest grade is a 91 and the highest grade is 100, you can have a 93 and still get a D or an F. Because it's the bell curve. The bell curve says that 50% of the grade should be Bs and As. 50% should be lower than that. Now, out of those, we have these separations. So if I give everybody A's, then that's an easy class. What I should do is look at everybody's final grades, figure out the bell curve for that, that class, and associate the grades to those. That would, that would include everyone? Everybody in that class. So if you're high on scale, everybody low, it's just going to be Well, no, if you're high and everybody's low, you have an A for sure. Uh -huh. the, and the, these people, <laughs> well, we call those people curve breakers. If your score is here and you made 100 on the test, everybody else is squirming down here at 30s. You've just taken the average from here and put it over here. So what did you just do? You just made these people either Ds or Fs instead of Cs and Ds. That's how people hate, why they hate curve busters. What's that? Yeah, yes, that, that's one thing, yeah. <laughs> is exactly, because if you rake a leaf, uh, a stack of leaves, what's happening here is just, it's getting grown out that way. Yeah, so, and the reason they, you, if you ever hear, besides the Wailing Wall, you all heard of that in Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall is a true phenomenon in professional schools, like law school. Because after the grades are, are posted, if you're in class, you will hear people scream because they just failed a course because of the curve they will start crying because you just wasted each class in law school is at $35,000, $40,000. Exactly. You've just wasted that much money because of that. So people literally fall down on the ground crying because they're done. Are they getting petitions with that change? No, why? Would you want an attorney who got a great change because they cried a lot? No, no, not the great change. I'm talking about getting the grades instead of using the bell curve. Again, which attorney would you want to buy? 
this person or these people who know 30% of the law? So if you're, if you're gonna hire a person, it's the same as med medical school. You want the doctor who graduated at the top of the class or the bottom of the class? They're both doctors, yes, but which one knows more? Exactly. Which is how come a lot of people say, I don't want doctors who get degrees from other countries because they're not the same as American doctors. So it's scary. Yeah. Well, 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 with something like that, you know, they base that on study, but whereas some people overseas, they have more hands on experience with something versus somebody else. That's yeah. true. Yes, they're hands on, but. Doctors don't have that luxury a lot of times to spend 45 minutes to an hour with a patient. Because the longer you spend with a patient, the fewer you get to see. And those patients that waited two days to see you are going to get tired of you and go see somebody else who's going to see them in the next hour. So, again, it all has to do with dollars. Okay, in experiments. We have something called confounding data. If you ever read Harry Potter, the confundus charm, being confounded. What does that mean? Confused. Confunding data is, you, you see, you have some effect occurring. but you can't determine the cause. What specific factor is causing this effect. Again, we don't know what's causing it. We could spend a lot of time trying to figure it out and hopefully find it. It's, it's kind of those things, you, you have this noise in your car. You take it to a mechanic and you can't get that noise back. Or you have a pain somewhere in your back or somewhere in your body. You go to the doctor and it's gone. That's confounding. So you can't find out where it is, but it's there. It's going to ruin your experiment. So how can you go about avoiding that? You can't fix it because you can't find it. So how do you go around it? You get a completely Completely randomized experimental design. Because what you're saying here is uh, if you didn't, if you weren't completely randomized when you did the, the design and you picked your data, you somehow inadvertently affected how the data was chosen or uh, collected. 
Again, you can't find it because it happened once or twice. There had to have been some external input in there. So you go back and you re re redesign your, your whole experiment. Completely randomized. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You have no input what goes on here. There are four different ways of doing this. And here they are. The first one is by random selection. Completely random. In this course, later on, we're going to look at these charts. I'll, I'll give you guys charts that are called random number generators. Because if you, if I, if I asked you to give me a list of d numbers, digits, single digits, from zero to one or zero to nine, give me fifteen of those. You couldn't do it. Truly randomized. You start writing numbers down. Eventually, you will think, well, I, I wrote, I can't put that down. You'll hesitate. You cannot randomly select a certain number of, of elements without having your brain start putting input into it. So they, they have this computer generated chart of numbers, a thousand numbers, thousands of numbers, where we use to generate numbers randomly. And this is how we do something like this. We'd assign numbers to all these people and then go to this random number generator and select, I want 15 digits. Let me show you how this one works. So we have, it's grouped like this. And it's, it's so far, it's groups of four. And you have columns, numerous, and there's columns of these things. I can choose anywhere I want to in this table, choose any row, any column, and start. I say, I'm going to start here at this number. It's totally randomized. So if I want to pick seven people, this would be my first, the seventh person would be the first person, then the sixth, then the fifth then the second, then the first person, I can't use them again. I can't use these. Then the fourth, I would go on till I have my people, my survey size. So this would be my first data set, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh number. So the people who are in these locations have been selected. That's completely randomized. I had nothing to do about that. The only thing I did was put my pencil where I want the to start the numbers. And that, that has no effect on who I choose for this experiment. So that's, that's random selection. The next way is by the random block selection. A block is a group of similar objects. They have to have something, some characteristic that makes them the same. Blocks differ in ways we might affect the outcome in the experiment. So, for example, in this example, we form two blocks, one block of women, one block of men. They have similar characteristics. The, the, ent the elements in each uh, block have to have some similar characteristic that you're exam examining. Randomly assign treatments to the subjects within each block. So now, 
in each block, I go through and I randomly select members of that block to give them the treatment. Remember, this is an experiment. There has to be some treatment involved. I have to in, inject something. But the selection of people I give the treatment to is totally randomized. So this is the same as we did talk about the 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 t-shirt cannon. I cut the stadium in half. And then the people on this side, I shot, I give them that cannon. The turnaround, people on this corner, I give them that cannon. So again, it's all randomized. Matched pair design. Comparing two group, two treatment groups by matching subjects with related or similar characteristics in pairs. Remember, these are both treatment groups. I don't do this to the control group. They're my treatment groups. And you've heard of, well, before and after. What's the, what's another type of, of survey you would do before and after? What's what's the name for that? Pre and post test. In education, that's usually, I would give you a test before the semester starts. The actually, I would give you the final exam before the semester starts and see what you made. Then I give you the same final exam at the end of the semester and see how much better you did. If you scored higher, then you learned something, which is the, the whole purpose of education. If you scored the same or worse, then think of another profession. Because something's not happening. You, sh you should at least learn something while you're in school. So before and after, matched pairs consisting of measurements from subjects before and after some treatment. Each subject yields a measurement before and after experiment. This is, this is called the pre and post. The example here was twins with toothpaste, the Crest toothpaste commercial. It's been researched and found that identical twins, they do a lot of things similar, but when it comes to certain things like toothpaste or uh, colors of cars or type of cars. They'll pick absolute, completely different, opposite types. One twin could, could drive a sedan, the other one drive a truck. One twin could like country, the other one could like rap or rock or something else, some other music. So it's, but they'll do everything else. You ask, you, you watch how they behave and they behave almost identical, but they're in, in, individual preferences could be totally different. So this is what we're looking at. Here's the before and here's the after. You have these, these two people have their before and after experiment, before and after treatment. What are you looking for here? Any changes? Uh, we had an example of this yesterday. Temperatures, if you took uh, the person's temperature in the morning and the evening, let's see what happens. Um, you could do the same thing with, uh, if, if I was researching for Gatorade or one of those energy drinks to see how much hydration you have before and how, exercising, and then at exercise, drink your Gatorade, see what your hydration level is then afterwards to see, does it really hydrate you? What would be your control group there in that, in that experiment? If, you, if you're seeing which water, yeah. 
you'd have Gatorade, you'd have what other ones, Powerade, and you have water. You'd have people see test how see how hydrated they are before ex exercising. Have them go through the same exercise regime, and then then check to see if they're high, their level of hydration. Give them the drink, and then retest it to see how much did it rehydrate them. But they have to be again. They have to be identical, the similar characteristics. They have to be the same shape, same physical body. So you can get a better study on a result on this. And the last one is the rigorously controlled design. Assigning all subjects to different treatment groups so that those given each treatment are similar in the ways that are important to the experiment. Again, assign subjects to different treatment groups so that those given each treatment or given the treatment are similar in ways that are important to the experiment. Again, that's a, that's a long sentence, pretty complex if you think about it. Let's break it down. After me, Richard. Okay, so let's do the first part. First condition, so assigning each subject to different groups. So we have multiple groups. So that those given the treatment are similar in ways that are important to the experiment. So we have to first understand what exactly is our experiment looking for. Um, let me think of an example here. What item, medicine or something, is specifically for one gender as opposed to another? Mitle. Well, mitle works for both men and women. But it's specifically designed for market. Yeah. For the menstrual menstruation pain? How would you design that? How would you test that for men? <laughs> yeah, it's 100% works for men because they didn't never get menstrual pain. Yeah, my own. <laughs> that would be one fun test. Uh, yeah. Nope, is. Well, yeah, you could use mitral then for menstruation because you have your two groups you have all women and all men. Your, your treatment is the mitol. And the, you look at, do they feel pain? But then the men are given a placebo. What pain would they be trying to eliminate? Good point. Yes, because menstruation pain is just not just, low. it's also the headaches that, that are given by it. That's a good point, yeah. So we're testing to see if mitol affects men and women with headaches the same or differently. So yeah, that's actually, we would separate the two. Both group are people who have headaches and then we give them the medicine, the mitol, the treatment to see. Of course, the men will get the placebo, they get sugar tablets. And so, forget the men, they, they, they deserve headaches. So we give it, we give it once, 
That's supposed to treat the simple. The, the supposed sim for therefore one set of gender, which you well, both genders are trying. Right. Because what you're seeing here is is that is the treatment gender specific or treatment specific? So yeah, this is very regularly controlled because it, it's you're looking at specific groups here. And that you have to make sure that they're experiencing it at the same time. Actually, you see a lot of these commercials on TV and on the internet, actually, that people were looking for people who have sleep, who have trouble sleeping. They have to be between the ages of 18 and 25. Because what they're going to do, they're going to see how well you sleep. They're going to give you a treatment and to see if it fixes your sleep or not. Again, that treatment, it could be a placebo or not. So given the list, both know that that Yes. Okay. But again, you don't have to tell them it's for headaches. But also being something Yeah, I said you wouldn't say it. Yeah, so you wouldn't you, <laughs> you wouldn't get any men for it. But uh, right. But yeah, we're looking at But my doll is a perfect is a is an excellent excellent example because it's supposed to also alleviate be great for headaches. Water yeah, or water retention, yeah. So yeah, so men experience those. It's just that it's usually Associated with menstruation, okay. but it does so many other things. So to be fine with regular acid, right? Actually, acid. if I'm not mistaken, um, Viagra was first marketed as a medicine for headaches and things, <laughs> not associated with other things <laughs> that we are now associated with. So that was that's what it was first tested. It was it so happens that. They found other uses for it. Now, don't they test like, like the different medicines coming out? Like, on, I know they will have test test subjects, but before they do go that route, don't they test it on animals? Yeah. Well, they do, they they can, but it's not necessary. They do test of, to see if it has negative or harsh reactions to it. But yeah, that's what they use mice and so, but rabbits and pigs are the best because rabbits, their circulatory system is most similar to ours. If you ever take a human animal physiology class here in college, an AP, if you're interested in pre med or medicine, any type you will spend two semesters dissecting either a frog, a pig, or a rabbit to look for the circulatory system, the respiratory system, all the other things, because they're very similar to ours. Last thing. Sampling errors. Errors can occur no matter how careful you are. In design and execution of your study. It's called human, it's called the human factor. Humans are fallible machines, which is why we need computers to make us less fallible, which is gonna be our demise. Of course. <laughs> oh yeah, we've done fabulous. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of old textbooks they used to use in the 18, 1800s and 1900s, um, math courses. It is much more advanced than what we have nowadays. What the, what the kids in elementary school, junior high, high school, what they had to go through, our elementary schools back then used to teach what high school kids learn now. Again, kids are like sponges. They'll, they'll learn wherever you teach them. You just have to teach them. And learning starts at home. So the parents have to start teaching them at home at an early age. Anyway, three common sampling errors. Uh, random. Sampling error. These occur. When the sample has been selected randomly but there is a discrepancy I'm sorry to do that between the sample result and the true population. Result. Okay, give me, what does this mean? Error occur when samples, a sample has been selected randomly, but there is a discrepancy between the res sample result and the true population result. Is it like small and asking being online, and then you see all the responses? No, they're online. And then they go, yeah. Yes, that's a perfect example. Or another, of a company, they go to a mall, they go to a big stadium and uh, research people, question people. And they say that it's open to, what soft drink do you prefer? And they all say, say Dr. Pepper, or majority of them say Dr. Pepper. So the stadium gets a contract with Dr. Pepper to be their soft drink supplier for the next season, but nobody buys it. The sample size they used was small, that that sample liked Dr. Pepper, but the population that go to the stadium prefer something else. There is, that's an example of a sample error, a random sample error. This is what you came up in your study didn't come out what happened truly. Another example of this is political polls. If you ever follow politics, and when we get closer to an election, they take all these surveys. They take all these surveys. Who do you think is going to win? Who do you think is going to win? Who, who are you going to vote for? And they have all these news stories says this person is leading this person. But it comes out in the election day that the other person won. That is a prime example. That's also a way to influence future events. That's why I dislike those political polls when they, when they advertise those. Because if the poll says that candidate A is leading candidate B by such a large margin that my vote doesn't matter, I'm not going to go. If that's if that's uh, if my my vote's not going to make a difference, I'm not going to go. But if it was close, then that may influence me to go vote. So so those that's an example of random sampling error. Number two. 
non sampling error. This is the most common. Error from human from humans. I'm sorry, human error from humans. Enough said. Where can this happen? Error from humans. I know it's and the list is endless, pretty much. It's how they record the data. If there are surveys, how they recorded the survey. I mean, think about it. How many times they usually just ask you questions and then they check a mark on a box. What if they mark the wrong box? Either on purpose or by accident. You've just ruined the whole study. Um, calculations, data entry, all this stuff is human factors. So, and this is the most common, this is the first thing you wanna look at in any experiment. Where were humans involved? Let's look at, let's see what that, that can happen. Non-random sampling error. Error. We're using a non-random sampling method. <laughs> well, no, it's, yeah, because it's, if it's non-random sampling, what other types could it be? Maybe we have convenience sampling. Uh, it could be any, any of those other ones. If it's non-random, that means you put some thought behind it. Strata, strata sampling, stratified sampling. So once you do that, again, if you do that, what happens? You now have a human in there. So this is in essence, really human error. So when it comes down to, to uh, design of a study, the more time you spend up front, planning and designing, the more time you'll save at the end. Because planning is important, then execution. Once you get the data, that's, that's all you've done mechanically now. All right, so that does it for chapter one. Tomorrow I'll be online at 9.30 doing, I'm gonna start chapter two, section one. But I'll, I'll also repeat it on, Mon on Tuesday. Remember, I won't have, I won't be here Monday because I'll be at the dentist. <laughs> so yes, everybody have a great day. And let me hope I recorded this.